If you've tried to buy a Raspberry Pi in the past year, then you've probably experienced some level of difficulty in getting one. They're out of stock almost everywhere, there are generally purchasing limits on any that are in stock, and they're being sold at way over the recommended retail price. A big part of what makes Raspberry Pi boards so attractive is that they've got really good documentation and support and a large online community, so you'll easily find projects, tutorials and answers to any issues you run into along the way. With that said, there are a large number of single board computers available that offer similar features to Raspberry Pis, so I thought it would be interesting to get a few and try them out. The Raspberry Pi 4B is one of the most popular choices for current projects, so I looked at some alternatives that offered similar specs to the 4B and were similarly priced as well. I'm not looking for high-end hardware here, this isn't meant to be a benchmarking exercise. My intention is for these boards to be suitable Raspberry Pi alternatives for tinkering with electronics as well as basic web browsing and video playback. So there might be more powerful or newer versions of these boards available for an increased price, but I looked at the ones that I felt provided the best value for money for what they are going to be used for. I also had a brief look at the documentation available for each before buying them, to make sure that they had some basic guidelines to get started. These are the three boards I settled on. First up is the Orange Pi 3 LTS. This board runs an all-winner H6 ARM Cortex A53 quad-core processor, running at 1.8GHz. It's got 2GB of DDR3 RAM and 8GB of onboard eMMC storage. This was the cheapest of the three boards at $35. The second is a Cardass Vim 2. It's got an 8-core Amlogic A53 SoC, running at 1.5GHz. It's also got 2 gigs of DDR4 RAM and 16 gigs of onboard eMMC storage. This was the mid-range of the three at $80. The third and the most expensive of the three is the ASUS Tinkerboard 2S. This board runs a 6-core Rockchip RK3399 SoC. It consists of a dual-core ARM Cortex A72 processor running at 2 GHz and a quad-core ARM Cortex A53 processor running at 1.5 GHz. It's got 2 gigs of DDR4 RAM and 16 gigs of onboard eMMC storage. This board costs the most at $120, which is a little bit more than the recommended retail price of even the 8 gig Raspberry Pi 4B. But it looked like it had the most comprehensive documentation and looked like it was the most suited for electronics projects using the GPIO pins, rather than being used as a media player or home server like the other two. This was just my first impression when looking through the documentation of the three boards, so that's why we're going to try them out. For each board we're going to take a closer look at the hardware features, then have a quick look at the operating system that is shipped with it, then try to get an LED to blink with one of the GPIO pins, which may require a different operating system to be loaded, and we'll finally look at the power consumption of each. Let's start out with the Orange Pi 3. Taking a look at the hardware around the board, we've got onboard Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, an infrared receiver, 26-pin GPIO headers, USB 2.0 and 3.0 ports, a 3.5mm audio jack, microphone, full-size HDMI port, a power button, USB-C power input, and then a microSD card slot on the bottom. The GPIO pins roughly mimic pins 1 to 26 on the Raspberry Pi, so you may be able to use some shields and adapters that use only a few pins on the Pi, but my experience is that these are few and far between. It's more likely that you're just going to find it useful if you're already familiar with the Pi's GPIO layout. The Orange Pi 3 ships out with an Android operating system image pre-installed, so let's take a look at that first. This and the Cardass board look like they were intended to be primarily used as media player devices, so this preloaded operating system is probably quite useful for that. So as you can see, the Android operating system that it ships with is quite bare. You'll need to install your own apps to get any meaningful use out of it over and above just playing content from a connected drive. So we can't really do much more here without installing additional software. But we want to use it for an electronics project that makes use of the GPIO pins, so we're going to need to install Debian anyway. They provide a Debian operating system image on their website, so let's get that installed onto a microSD card and boot it up. For all three boards, I'm going to use Win32 Disk Imager to flash the operating system image onto a 32GB SanDisk microSD card. With Debian booted up, let's try playing some video content to see how the hardware handles it. I'm going to try play Big Buck Bunny on YouTube on each device to see how they perform with video streaming. 
It seemed to handle this first pass reasonably well, with only a few missed frames, but it did look like it was running on a lower resolution, and heading over to the settings confirmed this. So I switched over to 1080p and then tried again. This time the Orange Pi really struggled with the playback. You'll notice it's stuttering, dropping frames and required some buffering during playback, which is not a limitation caused by my network. So you probably wouldn't want to use this Pi for media playback, even at only 1080p. As far as documentation goes, the user manual covers a pretty broad range of tests. This allows you to check the basic functionality of almost all the features in the Orange Pi, and it's reasonably well written. They have a section on using the GPIO pins, with one in particular for control of digital pins, so I'm going to work through that. I ran an update, then downloaded and compiled the wiring power library. Now let's connect our LED to the GPIO pins. The LED works when it's connected to ground and 5 volts, so we know that the pins are powered. Now let's connect it to pin 7 to test. Using the GPIO read all command, we can see what GPIO number corresponds to physical pin 7 in the table, so that's GPIO 118. If we set it as an output pin, we can now see that the mode has changed to out. We can then try setting the pin high or low using a 1 or a 0, and our LED is now turning on or off. There are also a few examples in the wiring pi library to help you get started with coding your own projects that use the GPIO pins. So it was relatively easy to get an LED to turn on and off using the GPIO pins. They also have a dedicated forum with a fairly active community. Most questions or issues raised get useful answers in a day or two, and they cover a range of topics from questions for beginners, troubleshooting assistance, help with drivers, and even topics on various distributions, all of which seem to be quite active. Taking a look at the power consumption on the Orange Pi 3, it uses around 2.3 watts at idle, and around 4.3 watts when the CPU is loaded. So it's quite an efficient board at less than 1 amp draw at 5 volts, even when loaded. So for $35, I'd be happy with the hardware in the community around the Orange Pi 3. Next up, let's try the Cardass Vim 2. Taking a look at the hardware around the board, we've got two USB 2.0 ports, so no USB 3, we've got gigabit ethernet and a USB-C power input, a PWM fan connector, reset function and power buttons, a real-time clock header, a 40-pin GPIO header, infrared receiver, and onboard dual-band Wi-Fi and Bluetooth. On the underside we've also got a microSD card slot, and then a range of pads for power input, MCU and GPIO connections, which are great if you plan to use this board on some sort of expansion module or PCB. The Vim 2 has a 40 pin GPIO header, just like the Raspberry Pi, but the pinout is quite different, so you won't be able to use any Raspberry Pi shields or hats on the Vim 2 directly. Like the Orange Pi 3, the Vim 2 also ships out with an Android operating system pre-installed. This version of Android has a few useful apps pre-installed, so we can actually try streaming Big Buck Bunny directly. The Vim 2 is doing a much better job at streaming this than the Orange Pi 3. This is probably also partially to do with the lighter weight operating system, so we'll see how well it runs on the Linux based operating system after this. It's also running at 4K, so that's a much better resolution than the Orange Pi 3 could handle as well. Next let's take a look at how to use the GPIO pins to turn on and off an LED. For that we're going to need to install a Linux image. They provide a list of up to date operating system images in their product documentation. 
So it's as easy as heading over to the page for your board and then downloading the image that you'd like to use. To boot the Vim2 from an SD card rather than the built-in eMMC storage, we need to enter keys mode using the side buttons. Now that we've got it booted, let's try streaming on it. Before I play the video, let's just check what resolution it's running at. So this is running at 1080p like the Orange Pi 3 was. The Vim2 also struggles a bit when streaming HD content on the Linux-based operating system, with similar issues to the Orange Pi 3. So if you're going to be using your board as a media player, then you're probably better off running an operating system that's designed for media, like Android, Plex or Kodi. Now let's try to plug the LED into the GPIO pins and turn it on. I'm plugging it into GPIO pin 7. Again the LED works on the 5V and ground pins, so the GPIO pins have power at least. They tell you that the AmLogic chips include two GPIO ranges, and they then tell you to figure out the range base for your GPIO pins first using this command. You can also get the pin index listed for each GPIO pin by entering another command. They provide this for both GPIO ranges, but there's no information on which range is used for what, or how these are actually mapped to the GPIO pins. I found it easier to just get the information from the GPIO read all function, as I did previously on the Orange Pi 3. If we look at the table, physical pin 7 corresponds to GPIO number 471. So now let's try run through the process to set that pin up as an output and turn on the LED. If we set it as an output and check its status in the table, we've now actually got pin 6 set as an output. If we cycle it on and off, the LED is not doing anything, and from the table it looks like it's cycling pin 6 on and off. So let's try and move the LED to pin 6. Now we can turn our LED on and off. This seems like a trivial issue, but small issues like this can leave you wasting hours fault finding. If I hadn't used the read all table, I probably wouldn't have found this issue, and I would have spent time going back through the setup and control steps trying to figure out what I had done wrong. I also found two annoying things when using the Vim 2. The first is that the USB-C power port is too close to the HDMI port, so unless you're using a low profile cable, you'll end up having to wedge the two in alongside each other. The second was that the buttons on the side were really easy to push when trying to remove the cables. When trying to plug or unplug a device or cable in, I'd often press one of the buttons by mistake when holding the board, and this caused it to turn off or reset, which was obviously frustrating. They have fairly good documentation, and there is a lot to work with. They also have a good spread of information on the hardware and software side, but there are some obvious omissions. They have an online community and forum which has open topics, but the community doesn't seem to be as active as the Orange Park community. Taking a look at the power consumption on the Vim2, it uses around 1.5 to 2 watts at idle, and about 3.5 watts when loaded. So it's a bit more efficient than the Orange Pi 3, and I thought this was already quite good. For $80, I'd say this is probably a bit better than the Orange Pi for a media center, but it looks like it's got a smaller online community and a bit less support. Lastly, we've got the Tinkerboard 2S. This board, although the most expensive of the three, is probably the closest to the Raspberry Pi, it's got the same footprint and general layout as the Pi 3B, with a couple of standout differences. It's got three USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-A ports, and a single USB 3.2 Gen 1 Type-C port, with the ability to drive an external display hooked up to the USB Type-C port, so you can run dual displays although it's only got a single HDMI port. It's also got dual band Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, a DSi and CSI connector, a 5.5mm DC barrel jack for power, 2 pin fan connector, a real time clock battery connector, 40 pin GPIO headers, 
and on the back is a micro SD card slot. Another appealing feature is that the GPIO layout is exactly the same as the Raspberry Pi, and with the same footprint you should be able to use some of the same shields and hats on the Tinkerboard. I couldn't find any information on whether the Tinkerboard's onboard EMMC storage was preloaded with a particular operating system, so let's just plug it in and see whether it boots. After a few minutes nothing had come up, so I guess it isn't preloaded with any operating system, which is a bit strange for a device with onboard storage. There are two options to boot the Tinkerboard from. The first is to load an operating system image onto a micro SD card, and the second is to load the image onto the built-in EMMC storage. I'm going to load it onto a micro SD card, as that's what I've done for the others. From their website you can download a prepared operating system image called Tinker OS, which is based on Debian. Now that we've got Tinker OS installed and booted up, let's check the monitor resolution and then try streaming Big Buck Bunny. Of the three boards, this one has done the best by far at playing video content on Linux. There were a couple of stutters, but the image quality is great and the stream is actually quite usable. Unfortunately, the good start was short lived. It was at this stage that I realised that the documentation was quite in depth on the hardware side, but it was almost non existent for the software. After about an hour of reading through forums and pages online, I found a GitHub repository which was linked to by a few sources as being the best way to start using the GPIO pins. I tried this out a bunch of times in different ways, and even on different versions of TinkerOS, and I just ran into the same errors. I eventually found an answer to another person's question on a semi-unrelated topic, saying that you don't need to do the install that I'd been trying to do, as the libraries were already integrated into the later versions of TinkerOS. This led me to the next issue. All of the examples use GPIO pin numbers like 0, 10 or 12, but they don't ever say what physical pins these correspond to, and this isn't mapped out on any diagram or table that I could find. I eventually figured out that pin 12 referred to in the scripts mapped to CPU pin 146, which corresponds to physical pin 32, which was labelled GPIO pin 4C2. So after a few more hours than I'd like to admit, I eventually got a basic Python script like this to turn the LED on pin 32 on and off. In the documentation they claim that the Tinkerboard uses 3.65 watts at idle and 8.18 watts under load. My testing produced a result of about 3.3 watts at idle and 8.5 watts under load, so this lined up with their documentation fairly well. The Tinkerboard can also handle substantially more than this through power delivery to the connected USB devices, and that's why they've opted for the 12 to 18 volt barrel jack rather than a USB-C power input like the other two ports. So from trying these three boards out, would I recommend any of them? I'd say that the Orange Pi 3 is a worthwhile option for tinkering with basic electronics projects using GPIO pins. At $35 it's fairly cheap and you get a good set of features for your money with a reasonable online community to help you out. The Cardass Vim 2 is probably the best option for a media server or TV box, but you'll likely run into issues if you try to use it for electronics projects, and there isn't a whole lot of online support for it. The Tinkerboard looked like a great option on paper, and the hardware is quite impressive as well, but the documentation relating to the software leaves a lot to be desired. I wasted numerous hours going down wrong paths on the basics. At $120, I just couldn't justify buying this over even an overpriced Pi 3 or Pi 4. Through using these three boards, I was reminded why Raspberry Pis are so sought after. The documentation, software support and online community extends far beyond the actual hardware. Anyone can copy the hardware, but it's much more difficult to build an online community around a product like they've done with the Raspberry Pi. I've literally spent about 18 hours working on these three boards to get basic functions I've shown in this video working, and nothing I've shown is anything remotely complex.
It wouldn't have taken me more than 10 minutes to get a brand new Raspberry Pi running on a new operating system installation and blinking an LED. So if you value your time and expect to build projects that require more complex electronics or software to function, then I definitely still recommend spending the extra money on buying an older Raspberry Pi. You're not just buying the hardware, you're buying into a community, and you'll save yourself a lot of frustration in doing so. Thanks for watching. Please remember to like this video if you enjoyed it, and subscribe for more tech and electronics projects, tutorials, and reviews.